Uh, Lent continues this Wednesday, uh, and Lent dinners, it's uh, bring your own. So stop by your nearest fast food place, pick it up, um, go to work, prepare beforehand and bring it here, whatever, but we'll be doing dinner here at 515, service at 630. Um, the Lutheran Chorale, if you are into the Lutheran Chorale, uh, they are doing St. John's Passion here next Sunday at 230. If that doesn't work for you, they're also doing it at 6.30 at Mount Olive. Uh, that information's on our, uh, in our newsletter. You can scan the QR code there. Um, next, we- next, uh, next week, next weekend, something else is happening, and that is? Yes. John, well done. Daylight savings. Don't forget that. Daylight savings, because this one matters. If you blow this one, you will be late. Right? Before you just be early, we could hang out together and, you know, whatever. But you'll be late, so make sure you change your, your, your uh, clocks on that. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you is uh, Matt is leaving us. <laughs> As I slam down my Bible, he's hiding behind the, the pulpit here to hide from me. <laughs> so Matt's going on uh, to, to other things. Other things. Um, and so it's been five years right? Five and a half years we've had Matt with us, but uh, now it's time for something different, and so Matt will be leaving us, um, which, is, which is sad. He's, he's n- not just a, an excellent drummer, but just a, a great, uh, great person. I, I have been told that he will continue to come back and sub for us when available, so that'll be, uh, that'll be good, but if you would, join me in prayer, and let's pray for, for Matt and his family. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you uh, so much for the gift of friendship and the gift of community. We thank you that you bless us with Matt for five and a half years, Lord. Um, his, his, his friendship, his spirit, his, uh, his, his musical ability, it's just been awesome. And Lord, uh, sometimes things just kind of run their course and maybe it's, it's time for something new. And so we, we ask for a blessing upon Matt and we're, what is he going to do next? Um, we, we, we ask, Lord, that you would um, open the doors that need to be open and shut those that need to be shut. We pray a blessing upon him and his family uh, and, and what they do. But, Lord, most of all, we're just grateful, grateful for the time spent together, grateful that uh, we know that in your economy, in your time frame, this is certainly not the end. Uh, and for that, we are eternally grateful. Lord, bless him as you continue to bless us, we know. Uh, but bless Matt and his journeys. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Cool. Thanks, buddy. You bet. All right. Let's stand. Let's sing.
have a seat. <clears throat> so when I was, um, when I was little, I don't know how old I was, when I was little, we were all at home still, I think. So it must be pretty little. Anyway, my brothers and I were home, but it was summertime. We had other friends over there. My brother, my middle brother had gotten on the roof and, um, and I, well, he did something to make me angry or whatever. And so I was out in front and we have this big picture window in the front there 
Uh, and so I thought I'd throw rocks at him, right? I'll put it on the roof and I'll try to hit him. Uh, and of course, the rock I threw went right through the window. Uh, thankfully, though, right, it didn't shatter the whole thing. I don't know how that happened, but it just put a hole at the top. And I was close to it, and I just didn't. Darn. But cl- right there was a hole, and I thought, well, it's small, it's at the top. I bet my folks won't see that. Right? <laughs> if you know Clark, he found it, right? In, in no time, he found, he found that hole. Um, and, and, and it's like, oh, right? That's how it is with our sin, is we, we think, well, no one's going to know. God, I can hide this. I can, I can, I can cover it up. Um, and I felt bad for a long time, side note here, because they, you remember those stickers, um, like, uh, like the police stickers that people put on their homes, right? Uh, so he, we, we couldn't fix the window right away, so dad took one of those stickers and put it way up there on this, on this uh, window. So um, anyway, it, back to the story. The, um, that's how it is with our sin, right? We, 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 we think, humanly thinking, it's just absurd that God won't know. God won't find out about my sin. I'll just kind of play it out, right? Let it go and not worry about it. But the thing is, God knows. The only damage it does, not confessing our sin, the only hurt is to us. That's the only hurt. David says it in the Psalms. He says, hey, when I hid my sin from you, it's like my bones were being crushed. When 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 when, When God, I thought I could hide this from you and I didn't confess it, but I held it in, I was dying inside. That's how it is for you, I'm imagining, because that's how it is for me. When I think I can hide it, when I hold it in, when I don't confess it, I'm crushed. God knows that. He knows our sin. He says, come. Come to me and confess your sin. I already know it. (laughs) I already know your sin. I know this. What I want you to do is confess it. What I want you to do is come clean. What I want to do is relieve you of that guilt. What I want to do is relieve you of that shame. I want to relieve you of that burden. I want to give you new life. So come. Come. Come and confess your sin. Come and be renewed. Come and feel alive again because of what I have done for you through my son Jesus. So let's come before him now. Let's confess our sins and let's let God's grace restore us. We confess our sins now. Father, the absurdity of human thinking that somehow we think we can, we can hide our sin from the living God. That somehow the, the, the omnipotent, omniscient uh, God of the universe, somehow we can, we can hide our failings, our wrongdoings, our sin. That somehow we can just kind of pass them over and, and maybe you will too. But the reality is, Lord, that's not the, ca- you, not the case. You know everything. Everything about us. You know our deepest, darkest secrets. You know all of our sin. It's always before you. And Lord, all, the only damage we do when we hold it in is, is to ourselves. We let Satan get the upper hand. And so, Lord, we come to you now and we confess our sin. We confess that we have hurt other people. We confess that we have done things we shouldn't have done, said things we shouldn't have said, that there are things we should have been doing, things we should have been saying that we didn't. We confess, Lord, that we have sinned purely against you. And for that, we are sorry. For that, we, we come before you, Lord, and, and, and throw ourselves at your mercy. And Lord, in all grace, in all grace beyond understanding, you have forgiven us. You have restored life to us. Through your son, Jesus, and what he did for us on the cross, you have restored us to new life. You have forgiven our sins. You have washed us clean. And now you don't hold it against us anymore, but you say, go. Go and live in my grace. Go and live for me. Go and share the good news. And so, Lord, empower us by your spirit to do that very thing. To live new lives that give glory to you. To live in the freedom of forgiveness. To share the grace that you have so freely showered upon us. To share that with others. That they too may know the God who has given us everything in his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiving our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are your sins forgiven? Yes. Amen. Let's stand.
God, Heavenly Father, help us to stand in the presence of Christ under the, the shadow of the cross, Lord. That's, that's our home. That's where we should be. That is where our source of strength, our source of power, that is where our source of, of all things come from. You, Lord, are our light in our life. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do for us. May we live for you now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go and have a seat. So today we start our our new series for Lent, uh, the, the title there is Stones. Um, there's our readings for today. Hopefully you brought your, your Bible. Um, we'll start in Exodus. Let's see, how many points do you get today? How about... What? That's true, you did come out in the snow. My wife's clamoring for more points. All right. <laughs> Since I do have to go home with you. 8,000. 8,000 points, you brought your own Bible. If not, there's the page number. Uh, so Exodus 32 is the first one. Let's read that. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will be before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings in your, uh, that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a, of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. 
Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people who brought you up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the sheep of a calf. Then they, bow, they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Let's see, Moses turned and went down to the mountain with two tablets of, of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Then in 19, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. All right, our second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> starting in verse 17. Jesus said, <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpass, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. So like I said, this is our new series entitled uh, Stones. And stones play an important part um, in, in scripture, right? Both figuratively and, uh, and, and literally. And the stories they tell in scripture are very important to us. And the stories they, that we're going to be looking at that these tell us are the stories of our sin, right? The weight of our sin in our lives. But more importantly, they're going to tell us the story of, of Jesus and, and his, uh, his redeeming grace and how he removes the stones of sin from us. Um, you were all asked to grab a rock on your way in. So hopefully you did. Each week I'll ask you to grab a rock on your way in. Uh, they're they're going to play an important part of our series. They're going to help sharpen our focus uh, in terms of what we're talking about. So um, if you didn't grab one, walk out there and grab one now. Um, during, the, during our time together, after the message, uh, during communion, I will invite you to, if you want, again, it'll be a, your decision, if you, uh, to drop it in the basket down here in front of the, uh, the communion altar here. Uh, then each week, starting next week, there'll be a cross out in the entryway, and these rocks will find their way out to, to the foot of the cross. Um, each week, that will become a more visual reminder of the weight of our sin as our sin grows around the foot of the cross, culminating on Easter Sunday, uh, which with, with what I hope will be a very impactful visual reminder of God's grace for us and what he has done for us uh, through Jesus himself. So hopefully uh, you remember each week to grab your, your rock and your stone as you come in. So our text today has to do with God's covenant with his people. Um, just so you know, timeline, I think it's always important to give you a timeline, what's going on, what's happening here. Uh, the people have been freed from Egypt, right? So they spent 400 years in Egypt. Uh, God has now freed them from slavery in Egypt, and he's going to take them to the promised land, to Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. But before they get there, God has got to establish them. He's got to remind them. He's got to affirm with them that they are indeed his chosen people. Right? He's got to affirm that with them. You are my people. And so God, God wants, to, uh, wants them to know that out of all the people in the world, out of all the people, you are my chosen one. You're the ones I've chosen to be uh, my mouthpiece. You are the ones I've chosen to be my, uh, my light in this world. You are the ones I've chosen to be my, my priesthood, of, uh, my, my um, nation of priests. You are the holy nation. You are the ones who are going to shine my light and proclaim me to the other nations. But you are the chosen ones. Right? In me, you will find your life. In me, you will find your hopes and your dreams. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And when God said this to them, when, when he told them what this is all about, when he, when he gave them the covenant, if you look back in Exodus 20, right, the, 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 the covenant there uh, that we broadly refer to as, as, as God's law, uh, and then we kind of shorten it down to say the Ten Commandments, um, when, he, when he gives that to them in Exodus 20, their, their uh, words back to him are, Amen! We are all in with you. We will be your people, and we are, we are affirming this covenant. God said, fantastic. So he says, Moses, come on up, because they're, they're, they're based around Mount Sinai right now. And he says, Moses, come up. Come up and meet me on top of the mountain, and there we will seal the deal with the covenant written in stone. So when I say written in stone, what does that mean? 
Forever, permanent, unchangeable, right? Come up and I'll write this in stone. This will be an unchangeable covenant. This will be a forever covenant, covenant between me and my people. So Moses goes up at the top of the mountain. And only Moses could go up there. So there he is. He, he's in the, the clouds, right? With the thunder and lightning everywhere. And Mo- Moses stays there for 40 days. And while he's up there, God actually inscribes on the tablets with his finger this covenant for the people. A glorious day. Except the people, right? See, Moses is gone for 40 days. And I don't know if it happened on the 10th day. I don't know if it was the 20th day. I don't know if it was day 39. But the people grew impatient. They said, you know what? We can't wait any longer. We can't wait for Moses to come down. We don't even know where he is anymore. I mean, we see these clouds and lightning and thunder. Who knows what happened to him? But we need something else, right? We, we need a God that we can see, a God that we can, that, that, that we can follow. So make us a God, Aaron. So they make a God, a golden calf. Moses comes back down with these tablets now, and he hears what's going on in the camp. The, the, these tablets that have been written in stone, he comes down, and he sees this, and he takes them, and he throws them to the ground, and they shatter into a million pieces. Now, some people read this, and they think, well, Moses just kind of lost his temper. That Moses, in a, in a fit of anger, because he was just kind of enraged, threw these down, and was like, you know, I'm just mad at you guys. That's not it. Some people think it's just symbolic, right? Of, hey, you guys, lapse in judgment, kind of symbolizing, don't do this again. That's not it. When Moses breaks these these tablets, this is literally him saying, God saying through Moses, you people have broken the covenant. This is not symbolism anymore. You have broken what I have written in stone. What you agreed to, you blew. You couldn't do it. You have broken the covenant that we had with each other. That's what God's people did. Now, when I say God's people... I don't mean just the Israelites, right? Because we are God's people today, are we not? Anybody who professes Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are God's people. So how are God's people doing with that today? It's been 4,000 years. I'm guessing most of you here have read the Bible, right? So 4,000 years, we've read what these people have done. We've read where they've come from. Surely we have evolved. Surely we have gotten better. Surely we can now abide by this covenant. I mean, after 4,000, you get mad at your kids if they can't remember what you told them yesterday, right? So 4,000 years, you think we, now, now we can remember. Now we know what God wants us to do. Now we're good to go. My guess is we are just that much better than they were. Today in 2022, we have got this down. We have nailed it. We are the people now who can live by God's covenant. Amen? Yeah. If only, right? But just in case you are thinking you can live by God's covenant, let's just take a quick trip through the Ten Commandments and see how well uh, we're all doing with that. Let's just start with number one. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. So God is the thing, is anything that you love, fear, and trust above anything else. So is that God for you? Is that Jesus for you? Is Jesus the one you love and trust and fear above anything else? Or is it yourself? Is it your family that you love above anything else? Is it your status or your career or your bank account or your retirement plans? Is it your doctor or your ideology or a certain uh, politician or a political party? What is it that you love, fear, and trust for everything above anything else? Can you honestly say in your heart of hearts that it's Jesus himself? That's, that's one. Let's go for two. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Again, I've said this before, right? That, that God's name is not an identifier like our names. God's name is holy. God's name has power. Right? God's name is not something we should, we should just kind of throw around and trifle with. And yet we do that all the time, don't we? Oh my blank. Right? Or... In disgust, we'll say, blank, blank, it. We're happy to use God's name, just not in the way he calls us to use it. That's two. Let's go for three. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So while this commandment talks about a particular day, really like, like all commandments, it has a much broader meaning. See, God certainly thinks, believes that we should take a day of rest to re- reconnect with him, to grow in that relationship with him. But this, this meaning, the spirit of this commandment really has to do with every day. 
We're really supposed to be walking with God every day. We're really supposed to be Sabbathing with God every day. Growing in our relationship with Him. Depending on Him. Finding, finding our nourishment, spiritual nourishment from God. Seeking His wisdom and His counsel as we go through every moment of every single day. Can you say that? Can you say that emphatically? Oh, yes. Yes. Every day is dedicated to God. Every day is holy as I walk with Him. Fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. Again, much broader than the commandment, than the words the commandment say. This has to do not just with our mothers and our fathers, but it has to do with all those in authority. Can you truly say that you honor and you respect those who are in authority over you? But I'm gracious. I'm going to cut you a little slack on this one. Okay? I'm not going to, I'm not going to take the broad meaning of all those in authority. Let's just take the literal meaning. Honor your father and your mother. Can you say that throughout your life, even if your parents are dead, that that you really always honored your parents? That you truly honored your mother and your father? That you honor your mother and your father yet today? Can you say you live that? Five, halfway there, you shall not murder. So most of of us probably think you're you're safe on this one. If you're not, don't tell me, right? (laughs) You shall not murder. I'm good on that. Well, remember, like all commandments, it's a bit broader than the words themselves. This has to do not just with our actions of actually taking somebody's life, but it has to do with our actions in terms of hurting others with our actions. But Jesus took this even a step further. He said, this is not just what, how you harm people with your actions. He said, it has to do with your words as well. Are you harming others with your words? Are you taking the life from them with what you say and how you say it? Are you murdering their spirit and their life? Not just through what you do, but also what you say. And again, this this, this commandment carries with an element of um, commission, right? Those things that we do or say that are harmful. And also omission, right? Those things that we don't say and we don't do that we should do for the sake of others. Now let's go on to six. You shall not commit adultery. You think you're safe on this one? Remember, Jesus, Jesus expands this one as well. Right? He says, hey, where's your thought life? What are you thinking about? And let's take it to the 21st century, right? What are you looking at on the computer? How many porn sites do you visit on your phone or your computer? That's six. Let's go for seven. You shall not steal. We got tax time coming up, right? It's all right. Loopholes, I guess, if they're not going to close them. But do you cheat your taxes? Do you, do you cheat on time owed your employer? What about intellectual property? Do you respect that? What about the misuse of company equipment or funds? Even though you might think you can justify it, right? Well, they owe me this. Are you really not stealing from your employer? The business you work for? And let's just take the the, the meaning of the commandment, right? The, The plain text, you shall not steal, period. Eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And this has more, this is more than just telling lies. It has to do with gossip. It has to do with gossip about others and speaking poorly about others. It means Let's see the best in others and not always put the worst spin and assume the worst what others are saying or doing. And yet we live there, don't we? We love to put the worst spin on people. We love to put the worst spin on what they're saying and what they're doing, and we love to gossip. But I don't know. I shouldn't speak for you. Now let's get to 9 and 10. I think those should be combined anyway. I think the way we, we number them here in the Lutheran church is, is it just doesn't make sense. So 9 and 10, and they say what? Don't covet. Don't covet. And covet means simply this. The the desire to have the very thing that someone else has. You ever want somebody else's car? Their money? Their job? Their boyfriend? Their girlfriend? Their husband? Their spouse? Their retirement plans? You shall not covet. So let me ask. Let me ask. How many did you fail on? 10 out of 10? Maybe some really good, so, so, some of you are really good, maybe you got seven out of ten, right? You, you only failed on, on seven of them. Maybe somebody here is thinking, you know what, Greg? 
I only failed on one. I just one gives me trouble. Well, there's two things I know. First is, you're a liar, right? There's no one here today that failed on just one. But even if you want to sit there and go, no, 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 there's only one I really struggle with. I'll give it to you. But let's see what, let's see what James says. If you have your Bible there, go with me to James chapter 2. And so for those of us who are sitting here thinking, I'm okay, okay, I just deal with one of these. Let's see what James says. James chapter 2, starting in verse 10, says this. Whoever keeps the whole law, all right, there you go, and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. None of us keep the covenant. None of us can keep God's law. All of us, as Paul writes, have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not any one of us in this world who can say, God, I can keep your covenant. That's the problem is that we're all covenant breakers, right? That none of us can keep God's law. But that's not our biggest problem. You know what our biggest problem is? Our, bri- our biggest problem isn't that we've broken God's, pro- God's covenant. Our biggest problem is this, that we are broken people. That's really our problem. See, what we don't need is, we don't need somebody to come make us good, because <laughs> that's not the issue. We need somebody to come make us new. We need somebody to come make us new creations. Somebody to make us new people. We need somebody to come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We need somebody to come save us from ourselves. We need somebody to come to, to, to fulfill the covenant that we cannot fulfill. We need somebody to come and die the death that we cannot come back from on our own. We need somebody who can come and rise to new life so that we, by faith, can rise to new life along with him and live with him in righteousness. What we need is a savior. Who we need is Jesus. We need Jesus because Jesus is the fulfillment for us. Jesus has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He has fulfilled the covenant for us. Where we fail at every step of the way, Jesus has fulfilled that. He has lived it, and he has lived it perfectly. Where we should die for our sins, Jesus died instead for us. He is the one who redeems us. Where we should be lost forever eternally, he rose to new life that we might rise with him. That's who we need. We need Jesus to fulfill for us what was written in stone. And he has come and he has done that for us. So here's my challenge for you today. You've got your rock. And my challenge for you is this. You have two choices. You can either continue to hold on to that rock. You can say, you know what? I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident in myself. I'm willing to roll the dice. I can hold on to this, and I'm good to go. I believe I can fulfill God's covenant of my own power. I believe, given enough time, I can get it right. By my own power, I'm pretty sure I can get it, so I'm just going to hold on to my rock. And if you want to do that, that's your choice. That's your prerogative. Go ahead. But I do want to warn you, you're going to fail. You will fail. You cannot live up to God's covenant. But if you want to try it, go for it. But I guarantee all you'll be carrying around is the weight of your sin. The guilt and shame of sin. And you will lose. But the other thing you can do is this. You can take your rock and you can let it go. You can come up today and you can drop it in this basket as an acknowledgement that, you know what? I can't live up to the covenant. God, I am a sinner. And I'll fail on my own because I've failed before. And I need you. I need Jesus, the rock of my salvation. The choice is simply yours. And I don't say this very often because I'm a sinner and I'm a covenant breaker too. But my prayer for you today is simply this, that you would follow my example and you would leave your rock in the basket. You'll have an opportunity to do so if you want during communion. And that's probably enough for today.
where you and I cannot live up to the, the old covenant, where that's impossible for us. Again, if you want to try it, keep your rock. But where we cannot do it on our own, Jesus comes and he establishes a new covenant with us that he has done purely of, uh, of his own. He does all the work in this one where Jesus gives his, his, his very body and his blood for us. Where he says, I, I've done this for you. And there's nothing you can do. It's just my gift. I have given my body. I have given my blood that you might be my people. Not of your own will. Not of your own effort. But because I myself have done this for you. This is the new covenant. The body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. For the renewing of our spirit. That we might be able to live empowered by his grace. To live for him. And when we fail, when we stumble, it is this gift that renews us and strengthens us and reminds us of the covenant that he has made with us purely, purely on his end alone. We continue now with the words of institution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and drink, all of you. This cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray now together the Lord's Prayer is printed on the screens. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For those of you who are using the kits, we'll commune you first uh, this morning. If you're uh, new or maybe it's the first time using them, kind of wiggle that tab so it kind of snaps. Pull back the, the clear layer. Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Pull the next. Jesus says, take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Please rise. And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
Jesus is the fulfillment of the law for us. He has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The grace of God is amazing, is it not? So go share that. That good news, the grace of God with somebody. Tell them this week about Jesus. We'll see you next time.